Hello and welcome back to SFF 180 and night six, the halfway mark of the 12 days of Halloween 2017. Tonight, a pair of siblings from Innsmouth, Massachusetts, reluctantly team up with an FBI agent to investigate dangerous doings at Miskatonic University in Ruthanna Emerson's Lovecraftian reinvention, Winter Tide. Hello everyone, Thomas here, your host. As always, thank you for joining me. I have to say, I think including Winter Tide among my Halloween titles is a bit of a cheat, because it's not a horror novel, it's a fantasy. But it's a fantasy rooted in horror fiction's most influential, enduring, and challenged artistic legacy. Winter Tide, stylistically and tonally, is a very different monster from the Cthulhu mythos that inspired it. But what I admired about it is the way Washington DC writer Ruth Anna Emrys has written a book that doesn't just come from the simplistic perspective of someone who despises Lovecraft and wants to destroy and negate everything about the man. What Emerson has done instead is create a story that critiques and subverts the aspects of Lovecraft that are, for obvious reasons, in disfavor, while still respecting the creativity and weird vision that went into the fantastical elements of the mythos. It's up in the air as to which audience Wintertide might most appeal to. Now, I come from the, yes, Lovecraft was a vile racist, but I still love his stories camp. So my perspective is that non-fans will enjoy Emerson's take on the mythos a bit more than devotees, but Open-minded Lovecraftians may well appreciate the way Emrys has expanded upon a lot of his original concepts. The novel is set in 1948, 20 years after the raid on Innsmouth by federal agents that destroyed the esoteric order of Dagon and drove the Deep Ones back into the sea, as told in The Shadow Over Innsmouth. Emrys' heroes are Afra and Caleb Marsh, the last surviving members on land anyway, of the Marsh family who ran Innsmouth and its church. But in Winter Tide, the monsters of Lovecraft's original are the misunderstood victims. The Deep Ones aren't aquatic monstrosities, but a separate branch of the human race who dwell in the seas, although they can grow their population by mating with landlubbers. After the Innsmouth raid, the government moved the remaining townspeople to an internment camp, where Afra and Caleb eventually became the only surviving members, practically forgotten by the time the feds began using the same camps to inter Japanese-American families during the war. Afra and Caleb were then adopted by the Koto family. In this way, Emrys weaves the backstory of the Deep Ones and Afra's family into the context of America's long history of oppressed peoples. Years later, as an adult, Afra lives and works in San Francisco at a bookstore run by a close friend, Charlie Day, who's interested in the magic of her people. So that's all backstory, most of it related in a short story, The Litany of Earth, published on the Tor.com website. Now, Winter Tide has Afra and her brother, Caleb, a man <laughs> seething with understandable resentment, returning to Massachusetts and Miskatonic to assist FBI agent Ron Spector, who has evidence that the university may have been infiltrated by Soviet agents posing as students, looking to learn the magic of body swapping. The fear is that Russians will pass themselves off as doubles of leading American atomic scientists and steal nuclear secrets. It's too bad they didn't have Twitter and Facebook in 1948. The Russians would have found it a hell of a lot easier to infiltrate the U.S. without playing around with spellcasting. Anyway, I enjoyed the way Emma structured her plot so that Lovecraft fans will appreciate the callbacks, while non-fans won't feel lost. Now, apart from The Shadow Over Innsmouth, other stories referenced here are the thing on the doorstep with the whole body swapping thing, and also the Shadow Out of Time. Emrys weaves these classic tales into the backstory of her own book with impressive skill and without any sense that she's just doing fan service. Instead, you get the clear message that there is a rich mythology complete with expansive world building that Emrys is building upon, not simply piggybacking. Offer and Caleb soon establish their own little team to help with the investigations, and their personal goal is discovering exactly which of their family's books and manuscripts from Innsmouth ended up in Miskatonic's possession, and whether they can get any of them back. Charlie Day comes along, as does Afra's BFF, Nancy Koto. They enlist the aid of Professor Trumbull, Miskatonic's first and so far only female professor, who has an interesting secret of her own. 
They are also joined by Audrey Winslow, a student from a neighboring women's college, who at first seems a bit of a flighty dilettante, but soon becomes invested more deeply than she ever imagined in the dark magics lurking at the university. It's at this point that Wintertide becomes a found family story. Now, most everyone in the group is a bit of a misfit in their own way, and cleverly, Amaris has populated the group with the kinds of people Lovecraft himself would hardly have deigned to recognize. You know, immigrants, a black woman, some gay men. Deep personal connection becomes an important thematic undercurrent to the story. If the message of Lovecraft's fiction was that the universe is vast and cold, unfathomable, and madness-inducing in its sheer indifference to humanity's existence, then Emerson's response is that if the universe doesn't care about us, then fair enough. We'll just have to care about each other. But don't expect this novel to be full of eldritch horrors. If I have a criticism of Wintertide, it's that for all of Emerson's fine writing, and it is fine writing, not merely giving greater weight to character development than Lovecraft ever bothered with, but also fleshing out his world, making, for instance, Miskatonic feel like an actual university with a student body and a sense of college life. But the book is still excessively talky and in dire need of greater dramatic tension. I get that it's a fantasy rather than a horror story, but the pacing still lags more than it should, particularly in its midsection. And the Soviet espionage throughline is never given any real narrative urgency. Many chapters feel like they're just shuffling their feet. The book is more of a procedural than a thriller, and frankly, more thrills would have helped. But on balance, I like Emerson's characters and her expansions of Lovecraft's concepts and the human depth she's added to the mythos's already vast and imaginative and fantastical depths. If future sequels are tighter and punchier and a little more intense, so much the better. I can see so much that Emrys could do with the foundations that she has laid here. So stick a few more eldritch horrors into the mix for Afra and her family to overcome, and I'll be happy to let this tide carry me as far away from shore as it can. And that's it! That's all I have time for on this episode of SFF 180. Remember, the most important thing, these are reviews, you will not always agree with me, but if you enjoyed watching, please hit that like button, share the video far and wide with all of your SFF reading friends, and above all, please subscribe. If you haven't done so, that's how SFF 180 grows as a channel. You can also support the channel at my Tee Public store and at my Patreon, where recruits into Wink's army get little perks like getting to see some of the videos early, things like that. So I want to thank those people for their lovely support. It's very helpful, just as I want to thank all of you for being fantastic viewers. And so, until tomorrow night at midnight for the next installment of the 12 Days of Halloween, Spooky reading. <laughs>